Happy Blooms Day! June 16th! We made it! If you didn't know, Blooms Day is a day where we annually commemorate, and not just we, but a lot of people around the world that are Joyce fans, celebrate James Joyce. So happy Blooms Day to you out there. And welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am James Joyce. No crypto. And I am Una, and we've got a very special video today where we are doing Before You Read, a series that is meant to give you the information you need for really complex or works that maybe require a larger breadth of knowledge or preparation. And we felt like a portrait of the artist as a young man by James Joyce was just one of those works that really needs it. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to go through the first the kind of the scope of everything we're going to talk about in this video, because there are a lot of things that could help you potentially enjoy the book more if you know before you get into so it. So today we're going to be covering publication info, because it's kind of interesting how this came out. And I think it is very important to understand that. We're going to give you some resources that'll help you unlock some of the things as you read it. Uh, we're going to give you just a a little bit of his autobiography information because this book is heavily drawing upon James Joyce's life. We're going to go over some writing technique. We're going to go over some historical context about the Catholic Church and nationalism, which are just interwoven between all five chapters of this book. You really ought to be somewhat familiar with these. And then we're going to talk about the road ahead, where we're going to kick this series off with this before you read video. And our friends Lucas and Noah are going to do a chapter by chapter breakdown. I'm excited. All right, so start off with publication. Some sites and information will give you that it starts off in December of uh, 1916, but that's not the entire story. Now, since 1904, James Joyce had been trying to land a deal to, to launch this book. Yes. And it's kind of interesting because he worked on the Stephen Dedalus as a character, spelled the same way as, as the mythic hero Dedalus. And we'll go more into the meaning of that. But with publishers giving him responses such as, I can't print what I can't understand, <laughs> he had a hard time getting, the, getting this off the ground. Yeah, so he was faced pressures of what does he do with this? How does he take his artistic vision and actually make it happen? So it took him quite a while to fabricate his idea for the book. Well, yeah, I mean, he even in like mid-1905, paused working on this, went to go focus on Dubliners, came back and just scrapped what he had before. The original novel was like this Stephen Hero, and he just dismantled it because it was this original third-party omniscient narrative, and that's what became Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So this happens over many, many years. It's not like a lot of authors where they sit down and they're able to knock out a book within maybe a few months or something. He had to go back to this several times. Well, and it was first published, actually, interestingly enough, on February 2nd, 1914, which was his 32nd birthday. And it was serialized, where it was released in installments in The Egoist. And it wasn't until 1916 that it was released as a full book in the United States, which is a little misleading just to say it was published in 1916. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a, a very fun way of thinking about this book, right? Well, I mean, he had a thousand page manuscript and it got condensed down to, depending on the version that you have, I'm going to be working with the Centennial version from, from Penguin which is actually really good, and I really enjoy the footnotes, which the ping other versions of the Penguin have the footnotes too, but it's got a nice forward. So I think the version that you get matters for this because you're going to be flipping to the annotations a lot. But just realize that this is going to be a very dense work for meaning particularly. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And with that, because the book is so dense, I think that it's important to know that you should not start with this book if it's your first foray into James Joyce. In our opinions, you should start with Dubliners as you're going to enjoy his work a lot more and then think about coming into this after you've watched our video here, the Before You Read series. All right, so let's talk about why is this text important, right? Because really at the core, what you're getting is this story about systems being put onto people, right? It's Stephen Dedalus, the main character of this novel, is trying to figure out who he is as an artist. That's that's the name of the book, the portrait of the young man as an artist. But there's plenty of books that do the coming of age kind of story. So why did this one really succeed or thrive? Right, so we'll start with our more interesting ones and then go to ones that are maybe more popular or more frequently talked about. So in terms of the most interesting that I think is this book is literally a slice of Dublin. Like it's like you took a piece of Dublin and shoved it into a book. There's political intrigue. We've got the religious and state you know, opposition of each other. We have some hyper specific references to where shops are located or upon what street or whether they're heading towards or away from downtown. And I think it's actually a nice historical document that just kind of gets wrapped up for those that want to really immerse themselves in Dublin life. Yeah. I also think this is a, a, a mimesis type story, right? This is one that is art imitating real life. Very well. Very well. We've talked about this as almost, almost a uh, 
you could consider it a, a fictionalized autobiography of Joyce's life as Stephen Dedalus. Now, another reason that I think a lot of critics will agree why you should read this book is the play with language. When you take a thousand pages and shove it into 200 some odd pages, depending on your version, you're going to have some hyper realized, hyper condensed ways to phrase things. And the way that one sentence can be delivered by one author and it can mean one thing. And the way that James Joyce can take a sentence and make it mean two, three, four different things have references to to classic mythology, have references to very hyper-specific local Dublin things, and to even to just political and church oppositions. It's really hard to read, not because the sentences are hard to understand, but because all of the layers that and meanings that are put onto those sentences. Yeah, the way I kind of looked at it was, if you're reading a traditional book for just pleasure, a lot of the sentences are a single string. This story with James Joyce is a woven carpet where everything is threaded together. And when you take it apart, as Una said, one sentence can mean four different things depending on what you're trying to get out of it. And that is sometimes tough to swallow. And you have to understand some of the local events too that we're going to get into. But the opening line is from Ovid. It basically translates into, he turned his mind to unknown arts. And that's a reference to, if you know the story of Icarus and Daedalus, how they were, they created this labyrinth for the Minotaur, right? And then they're put in there. Well, the way Daedalus escapes, the way he escapes from his own maze of his own creation is he creates his these wings that, that him and his son can fly out with. And that's kind of a huge symbol that plays through this whole book. It was the opening, you know, epigraph. And then all the way up until the fifth chapter, there's constantly references to this because he's trying to become his own man. He's trying to make his own way in life. And it's subtly played throughout this whole piece and art like just injected into each sentence. Yeah, he's trying to escape over and over and over again the confines of a lot, I think. Well, another interesting point, too, about language is he'll actually just make you a part of the interpreter when it comes to that, too. It's one thing to have all these different meanings. It's another word to use the word like smugging, which has no meaning as far as my annotations mean. It's used in a sentence where you, the reader, get to play the game of, uh, it probably means this. But he literally just invented a word for you to try to play a role in this book in passing judgment onto what this sentence could mean. And as we read it differently throughout the story, I tried to interpret a lot of things without looking at the annotations at the end and was just following context clues. And that's very difficult to do when a word doesn't exist at all. (laughs) And now the most popular thing that everyone talks about, we kind of wanted to say for last, is the writing methods used in this. This is part of the postmodern movement. You'll know Virginia Woolf, interestingly enough, born in 1882, died in 1941. Same years that James Joyce was born and died as well. Very interesting. But in this era... These artists are kind of pushing language. They're pushing the novel. They're pushing structure of what we understand and don't understand. And James Joyce was at the forefront. I don't want to say the originator or creator, but he was definitely as one of the earlier adopters. You have things such as stream of consciousness with the idea of uh, things just kind of flowing. It's not naturalist where we try to lead ourselves to specific things. You just abruptly change positions in and out of things. And you've got free indirect speech or free indirect discourse, depending on who you're talking to, with the idea that there's a third person narrator, just like how the book originally started out with Stephen Hero. And then all of a sudden, you're in Stephen's mind. Just like if you've read Dubliners, hopefully before you've read this, uh, Eveline is a good example of that. Go watch our Eveline video where we talk about free and direct speech and the idea and the chaos it creates when you go from this judgmental you know narrator to being a member and an actor in this book this novel it's it, it throws you through through some emotions very brilliant the way he kind of pulls some of these off so next major point we talk about is some resources that could help you or maybe hurt your enjoyment of this book as i listened to it twice got it on audible and it is narrated by the famous colin farrell with his irish accent it is very difficult to understand this book at times because of not having the access to the annotations. Uh, So if you are just listening to this or if your version doesn't have the annotations like Una and I's, that is going to be something that you might want to go to outside sources because there are a lot of words specific to the Celtic language. There's a lot of stuff about the church. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of mythology. And so you might want to have other resources. So I'm going to point to you to two specific resources. I'll give you the hard version and I'll give you the light version depending on how much work you want to put into this like he said the public domain version that will put a link in the the box below if you want to read this 
book for free. It's in the public domain. But uh, I'm going to recommend two resources here that I think will help you out. So I'm going to give you the hard version, where if you really want to just really dive into this, there's Joyce Annotated by Don Gifford. This, along with like the Viking critical notation, these two did a ton of effort and work into annotating and bringing out, trying to avoid subjective thoughts and trying to be as objective as possible with their annotations. This book is a, is a gold mine. But then also we have Richard Elman's biography on James Joyce himself, Richard Elman. This is kind of the authoritative source on James Joyce's biography, but it's very, very thick. So if you're really going to be jumping into James Joyce, you probably are like either really into Dublin or is really into this and potentially considering trying to tackle Ulysses. I think you really need to pick up this book and consider it because it actually is quite interesting. Now, the easy mode, if you kind of like a light version of these two. The one I'm jealous of. If you get the Centennial version, which has great annotations, and we'll reference both the Elman and Gifford uh, annotations book, but there's also the light version of this, which is James Joyce Portrait of a Dubliner by Alfonso Zapico. And this is kind of a lot of what Elman's groundwork and research had done is brought into a graphical novel format, which is really interesting way. I don't know how many biographies you've read that are kind of in a graphical novel format, uh, but this has just been a very interesting way to reconsume the information, I felt like. Those are some things that I think you should consider because this book has... Well, over a thousand, right? Dare I say, there's probably a thousand annotations, but this book is so autobiographical. So the way that I kind of try to think about this is imagine having two overhead piece of plastic that the teacher used to use back in the day, or at least when I was a little kid. And one was all of James Joyce's life, and the other was this story. And you kind of put those over one another... And you would see that so many different things line up. And I think that's a really good way of thinking of like how seeing these on different transparencies and how closely they are aligned. So putting together the plan for this part of the video, I really struggled with it because trying to just give a complete biography would be one remiss of, of Elman's work. But two, this book is, as he was talking about with like the overlapping side of things, I feel like that would almost enter into spoiler territory. <laughs> So I wanted to call out, I think, three key things that you need to know that are very autobiographical, and I recommend you do some research into these to better understand this book. And that's one about his family. The Joyce family really did have 10 kids. The father really did have financial troubles in terms of struggling, trying to make ways, moving the family around to, to find cheaper living circumstances. And interestingly enough, their caretaker, Mrs. Conway, who's renamed for this book, and a lot of the characters in this book like, that's his dad. This is his <laughs> oldest brother. But they just changed names. But it's literally them in terms of how they interacted with James in the biography. But their caretaker was extremely Catholic. And this is bringing in some of the Catholicism elements of things, too. Where literally he'd be playing with a girl that was a Protestant. And she'd pull James away and be like, you're going to go to hell for playing with that, that Protestant girl as a Catholic man. So you start to see some of these like really shaping moments of what does religion mean to me brought in that actually happened to him and he just changed the name and then made that part of the book. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I think sometimes where you feel like it's just a transcript of his life, right? Well, it gets even worse, like particularly with, like, with the politics. James Stewart Parnell is James played by the role of James Stewart Parnell. <laughs> in this book, there's tons of talks about the nationalistic movement and how Ireland is under British control, and crypto will go more into that later, but they're pushing for independence. They're pushing for something different, and the Catholic Church doesn't want that. You know, Britain doesn't want that. And you see these clashing ideals of the, the church and me, of, of nationalism and me coming upon him, and these names weren't changed at all. Yeah, so sometimes you're going bouncing back and forth between historically accurate names and the names that he's changed from his real life, it can get a little bit confusing. And that's why you have to keep flipping back to the annotations. And as you pointed out, that can be exhausting. So historically, this is very reminiscent of the Gary Hart controversy. And you had to pick one side or the other. You were going to be a nationalist or you were going to be a loyalist. Yeah, you see this, how this really splits the country. It splits the boy psyche. Very important to kind of know what Ireland was going through with, with some of this controversy. And the last place to kind of mention that I just really wanted to call it from an autobiographical standpoint is a lot of the places and people are just things that happened to him in terms of going to the Clongos, Belvedere College, the financial woes. These are all things James Joyce experienced and is kind of drawing into how they shaped his life. And his teachers at school, this is hilarious, Father Arnell and Father Conmee 
were actually the guys that did this and they were actually the ones that kind of like beat him and kind of swept it under the rug so can you imagine being one of these two gentlemen and reading this book and just reading your name in here and it's exactly what you did to james joyce as a little boy (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you definitely tell that he was trying to get some revenge here or there, where he's like, oh, I'm going to change this because I might love my mother or father, but I hate these guys, so I'm going to get back at them, and I'm going to immortalize them inside the book. You can definitely see where he chose specifically to change some names to protect people, and others, he's like, nope, I'm getting you. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> All right, let's jump into no. writing technique, right? Because there's a big difference that this is not just a straight auto biographical story like this isn't written the way richard elman's is this is stylized there are parts that are hyperbolized there are parts that are made more simple to kind of mock or or ridicule like a father for example uh in this story so some people i just want to talk real quick about his writing technique would say that this is a slog boring or hard to get through sure some people may have an issue with the style. It may not clash with you. You could say that about any book, right? But I would argue that there are probably parts of this book that when someone says that, and I'll ask them, well, what did you take from this part? They probably are missing out on two or three or four of the other meanings of what's really happening in that scene. There's, I'm not saying they, they don't get it. I'm just saying there are more complexities to this that if things seem slow or boring, there's probably something else happening happening that you're not thinking about in the scene so i would really challenge you that if something seems boring there might be something happening behind the scenes here and we're not trying to insult anybody's intelligence because it it happened to me and i consider myself a very intelligent person it's just without all that extra context it's really hard to sometimes grasp what he's trying to convey to you so with that i think the goal is is that james joyce wants you to be steven Right, He uses specific language to put you inside of Stephen's head right from the very beginning of the story. And as you progress through childhood, as you grow up with him, I think you're supposed to be the reader. Because I think you're supposed to sympathize with Stephen throughout this story of the woes that he's going through as he's becoming a young man, as he's going through school, as he's trying to decide what he wants to be with religion. He's a young artist. And sometimes you make mistakes as a young person. And as a reader, it's hard to like Stephen. Yeah, and he does some interesting techniques to make you Stephen, right? He does this this stream of consciousness where you're just going with the flows. There's abrupt changes where all of a sudden in in the middle of a paragraph, you just kind of flip over to a completely different time and era in Stephen's life. And you have that, we talked about earlier about the free and direct discourse with the idea that sometimes you're the, the third person narrator where you're kind of judging Stephen, like you're talking about, like, you know, I don't know if Stephen's the best guy and you're thinking about that because he, he presents this this theory, this discourse, and then you take a step deeper where he starts to defend it. And then you take another step deeper where you start to talk about issues. And then in the final sentence, you are Stephen. We are fighting this issue. We feel this way. So it's very interesting the way he funnels you into being Stephen. And I loved it because it resulted in this very, very brilliant point of view for Stephen. As a young man, as we noticed in the first chapter, he kept using the word queer over and over and over again. And then it kind of dies off as you grow past that. Queer in the sense of strange or different is the usage of it here. Yeah. And then as he grows up, he's trying to to find himself in the position of the cosmos and you see where he tries to find his place inside of the church and inside of politics and inside love and inside his own self of what he wants to be as this young artist and what he wants to do with his life compared to what other people want him to do with his life and define me right that's that's the perfect way to describe it is all of these systems are being injected onto Stephen or projected onto him. This is how the church says that you're a good or bad person. This is how politics say you should or shouldn't be and what side you're on. This is how your family says you should behave. And Stephen's like, who am I? How do I mix all of these systems together and define myself? Let's go into some of the historical context here to talk further about how the church and other political systems influence this life because i think particularly this part if you didn't grow up catholic or you're not super familiar with catholicism well, well gosh let's let's be honest even if you are familiar with catholicism there's so many catholic phrases and background and histories and references made to this it's still you're going to find yourself flipping back and forth to those annotations if you got them. So I want to start off with the historical part of catholicism in Ireland and the relationship between 
Ireland, and Britain. And then we can get into more some of the details and we'll give you some information about Catholicism specifically itself. So if you were raised Protestant or some other religion, Hindu, Judaism, Islam, that maybe some of these things that just went woof right over you, we'll get to in just a second. Christianity was believed to be introduced into Ireland around the 5th century or so. We don't know exactly because, again, there aren't perfect written records. So we have with the death of Mary Scott in 1558, Ireland will officially break from the Roman Catholic Church and it will set up its own church known as the Church of Ireland and it will stay the official church for Ireland for nearly three centuries. And that's in significant importance to this story because this story happens during that time period. Yep. So talk to us about how British comes into the picture. All right, so Britain will always trying to be ruling Ireland. And basically from the 16th century, Great Britain will take control over Ireland and there'll be many wars between the two back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for about 200 years or so. Eventually we will get a free quote ish Ireland where it operates what is called a client state. And this is under the indirect control of a council in London that will control-ish kind of them. But they do have some freedoms. They do have some choices. I think, is it, I'm not saying it's comparable, but you can kind of think of it where the United States, when it was born and it came over here, it was still ruled by Britain. The whole representation, taxation, that sort of thing. It's not the same thing in Ireland, but you can kind of view it the same way with, we're not really our own country, are Yeah, we? and I'm glad that you brought that up. So one of the crucial years is 1798, where you have the rebellions and the Act of the Union. And this is where we see Ireland try to shift towards full independence. And it doesn't happen, but with the success of the United States gaining independence from Great Britain, we see Ireland try to start pushing back towards them. This is important because it results in the Act of the Union in 1800, where the United Kingdom and Ireland are created. So it is uh, worth mentioning that Ireland actually doesn't come independent until 1937, a couple of decades after this book is written. One of the things that all this is important, that they still don't have independence, but one thing they do gain is a little bit more tolerance for different religions. And this is going to start to create the divide, as we do have some Protestants in Ireland, and we do have uh, the majority of them still practicing some form of Catholicism. And we see that in the story, right? Because in the opening chapter, who could James Joyce not play with? the Protestant girl, the same way that he experienced going growing up. Which school could he not go to? Trinity, which was the Protestant school, which I think at a point in time actually said no Catholics are even allowed on campus, if I remember correctly. Like there's this this is not a peaceful go practice what you want. This was a straight up divide. Yeah, there, there, there's definitely a, a clear division between the two uh, Christian groups. The way Stephen experiences praying to Mary going to confession, telling sins to another mortal being before going up to the divine heaven. You see him to almost kind of even question the Catholic structure as opposed to the Protestant structure. And there's even some Protestants that kind of mock the Catholic structure a little bit in this piece too. So I've rambled on enough about religion, but there's one other major point that we have to talk about that is important to this, and that is politics. So, so when it comes to nationalism and the British rule, as Crypto said, the nationalists were seeking independence, right? And I'll put a link down below for the home rule movement. And that's where our boy Parnell came into play. He was kind of like the leader and figurehead of the nationalist movement. Now, on the other side was the Catholic Church, who didn't want that. They they had interests in Ireland serving basically Great Britain, right? Yeah. And what happened was the Catholic Church started to get involved. There was not a separation of church and state the way that we have in the United States, kind of. Uh, <laughs> no, they were very intertwined together. You couldn't tell where one end and the other started. At one point, the Catholic Church started having polling booths where they would start to bully and actually influence where people voted. And they were obviously voting for the non-split, basically. And the Freeman's Journal, if you've seen our sister's video, you heard me talk about how the Freeman's Journal was a very specific journal that supported the Parnellites reported that there was bloody and violent fights at the polling booth because of some of this influence that the church was exerting, ultimately leading to the controversy of Parnell cheating with the Catherine O'Shea, referred to as Kitty in this book. And basically, that's the church bringing out the sin, you know, a heavy Catholic country. Oh my gosh, this leader committing the mortal sin of cheating on someone. This was also a huge divide. It was a way of inserting good, right, morally right and wrong into the people. And why this is important is this is everything of how Stephen Dedalus 
experiences the world, of people telling him what's right and wrong, how you should morally condemn or not condemn some people when you go to hell, what happens. And this is what Stephen will struggle with in the middle of this divide of the church, of this politics. Everyone's being separated. Individuals are being separated. Families are being destroyed. This is what he goes through as a result. Yeah, we see that at the dinner table, right? I mean, it's literally tearing his family apart right there. And you you have the church influencing what politics choices should be made. You even have um, Mrs. Conway. I forget her character name, but in real life, it was Miss Conway. <laughs> she was a heavy nationalist but was also heavily Catholic. So she ended up actually voting the Catholic way, even though she was supporting nationalist ideals too. It was, it's very interesting the way it tears even an individual apart. So that kind of brings us back full circle to some things that we can talk about of Catholicism, because being raised Catholic, you still won't know everything, but not being in the Catholic faith, you may have just had so many of these things be like, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And so we just want to go through some of the things that is kind of like our 101 basics that you might want to know about Catholicism. Let's do it. So we can start off with what does the word mean? It comes from the Greek word uh, to mean general or universal. So universal religion, religion for all. One thing is that Catholics are Christian. It is the original Christian religion. It is Bible-based. They have different names for the leaders of the church. So like they call them priests or fathers, bishops, cardinals, and the head of all the people in the Catholic church is called the Pope. And he is kind of elected and picked um, almost like a president would be. Okay, why does this matter? Well, there's parts in the story where they're supposed to be referred to as father, but they may say sir instead. Or when he's getting, you know, religious advice from his friend, the friend might say my child, which is what the priest would call their their patrons, basically. So there's a lot of even plays on those word choices, too, in this book. A couple other things we can talk about real quick is that in the Catholic Church, there was just the Catholic Church. That was the only Christian church there was until 1517 with a very, very famous monk named Martin Luther. And he will argue against the, the church teachings. And one of the major things that the church is doing is selling indulgences, where you basically can buy your way to heaven. And he will write his very famous work, 93 Theses, and, you know, nail them to the door. And this leads to the Protestant movement. And that is important because in the story, we have the two different sides, you know, butting against each other. And you see the way to get into heaven or what sends you to hell is different between even just Christian ways of thoughts and Catholic ways that Stephen is struggling with this and even has some misconceptions where he might say the desire for for women might lead him to hell. What it the Catholic Church is very clear that it's not that, but you see him struggle with that, where it's the actual mortal or venial sins that he does commit that make him kind of experience the brim fires of hell and such. It's, it's interesting where the story takes the interpretation of what does sin and what does salvation mean. And one of the things that when I was talking to this, my wife who brought up was the idea of confession and sin. And a lot of people might not understand that because it's very different in maybe a Protestant church than a Catholic church where you have confession, where you go to a little booth and you talk to the father, the priest, the the, the religious figure and you tell him your sins, the things you did wrong, and then he's going to tell you what you have to do for penance or to get forgiveness from God. And if you didn't understand that, that could be very confusing of well, why is Stephen struggling with this in the story? Right. It's And that's part of what the Protestant, you know, critic criticism was, is that why do you tell a mortal person this? You should be able to talk just directly to God. Why are you praying to Mary? You should pray to God. And you'll see, again, a divide and structure put on people by these different religions. And then the Protestants, you know, in many religions, they they mock Catholics for their devout faith to Mary because you can pray directly to Mary and she will speak to God on your behalf since she's the mother of Jesus, the mother of, you know, living God here on earth. And that's a big contention between the two groups, even still to this day. So let's wrap this up with some very quick themes and then we'll talk about the road ahead and how we're going to kick off this project here. So I just want to do this real quick because we're I, hopefully we're going to dive into this more in the chapters and the wrap up. But the themes that you need to be talking about is self-discovery in a couple of different areas. So one of the things is taught language. That's super, super important and how he uses words in the story. We've already talked majorly about religion and sin and forgiveness and what does it mean to have child innocence to 
not having that anymore, right? Yep. We talked about politics, 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 politics. Uh, And then lastly, you know, artistry. What does it mean to be an artist? Or what is the point of an artist or being an artist? How do you grow into becoming an artist? How do you free yourself from the structures of these political divides, the familiar requirements, the church moralistic stance to really express beauty, to express what it means to be alive. That is that is what he is going to struggle with up through the end of this book. Uh, I just feel like all those other things are kind of superficial to Stephen as his self-restovery goes on. His main goal, once he realizes it, is that artistry. Well, it's interesting, too, because the way he, he learns to unlock these is, is the isolation all of these divides create and the humiliation family members and people go through when they fail to meet these standards is what pries the lever into freeing him. It's it's through these failures, through these separations that he's only eventually able to break free of the labyrinth to escape the 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 mire of Dublin to become his own person in in James Joyce's eyes. Or James Joyce. <laughs> All right now in terms of the road ahead Just recently, you may have seen Noah from Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse. He released a schedule, but this is the official kickoff of this project. We're very excited. We're hoping that you guys are going to read along, and hopefully maybe this video can help you a little bit in the before you start. But you're going to see in that schedule video where he's going to be talking about basically each week for the next few weeks, we're going to do two chapters. So chapters one and two the first week, chapters three and four the next week. And then the fifth chapter will be the third week because that fifth chapter is basically two chapters in length. Yeah, it's, and it's hefty. It's intense mentally, too. It's you, you start off as a child and end up as the adult, we'll say that. So I'm really excited. Can't wait to, to jump into this with you guys. We'll be joining in on the conversation on their videos. And then we'll come back here at the end for the kind of the wrap-up to summarize what, what were our findings as we tried to tackle this book, both from our view as well as from Noah and uh, Lucas's view Hopefully we can unlock some things and we'd love to hear your guys' view because James Joyce is very complex. We're not going to cover everything in these videos. We'd love to hear kind of your interpretations. There's going to be tons of, oh my gosh, chapter three alone had, I want to say 50 or 60 specific verse references from the Bible. It's insane how this piece gets (laughs) with the annotation. So don't feel bad that you keep flipping to the back. Don't feel bad if you don't want to keep flipping to the back, too. You can skip ones and if you're like, I probably know what this means. It's it's exhausting to keep doing that. So find the way that you enjoy this story the most and don't put pressure on you to have to know everything, to have to not read anything. Find the pace and rate that you find comfortable. If you ever start to feel lost or that something is maybe a little bit slow, maybe then start looking up some things or really really leveraging the annotations because that's when you're definitely missing something because there's every single line of this book means and interprets into something. And we hope you guys can enjoy that experience. Follow over to their channels for the chapter by chapter breakdown and we'll see you guys here for the wrap up at the end. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really hope you guys enjoy this book. Una out. Be the Steven. Peace.